All right, I'm going to leave my screen like this so that I can read to you at the bottom. Um, so the paper that you did yesterday um, where you were talking about the dangers of stereotyping and I asked you to look at each of these people um, and decide whether or not they were a victim, a perpetrator, or a rescuer and to describe, like use adjectives to describe why you felt they were that person. Um, so now we're going to look at the truth and I'm going to have you reflect on your um, first impressions versus reality, and then um, at the end, I want you to reflect on the dangers of stereotyping. Like, how can that get us in trouble um, personally, but also as a society? Okay, so Hannah Sinesh, she was a Jew. She is a victim, but also kind of a rescuer. Um, okay, I don't know if I can see this with that there. Let me figure this out for a second. I'm sorry. Um, I don't want to talk about her yet. Let's see. She's going to be tough today. Okay. We had that. There we go. Okay. She was a Jew who immigrated to Palestine. She was born in Buddha to pest Hungary. In Palestine, she volunteered as a paratrooper for the British in 1943 to go behind enemy lines and warn the Jews of their fate. After parachuting down and crossing the border into Hungary, she was captured, tortured, and killed. She was executed by a firing squad on November 7th, 1944, at the age of 23. She wrote poems and journal entries before she left on her mission. She never got to warn a single person, but her heroism is not forgotten today. So she's technically a rescuer. She's a victim, too, because she was killed, but she is a rescuer. So um, I'm going to stop here and I want you to tell me what you like, were you right or were you wrong? And how does that make you feel or what do you think about being right or wrong? All right. So Reinhard Heydrich. Okay, so you decided whether or not you felt like he was a victim, a perpetrator, or a rescuer. So I want to know, look back at your notes. Were you right or were you wrong? Um, he was actually an infamous Nazi whose nickname was the Hangman. He was one of the cruelest and most brutal mass murderers in Nazi Germany. He was also a fencer, a musician, so he's very civilized in the eyes of society, and he was a pilot. He built this SD, which is the Nazi intelligence agency. He coordinated with Eisten Gruppen, the killing squads. He also ran the Wannsee conference in 1942, and this is where all of the head Nazis got together, and they presented the final solution to the top Nazi officials. The final solution we will talk more about was the plan that they had to do away with, to kill, to eliminate, to exterminate the Jews. Um, in 1942, he was in charge of Czechoslovakia when he was assassinated while driving to work. The British believed it was important to take him out since he was set for promotion to be in, put in charge of Paris, France, and there was no telling what he would do there. The two assassins had a gun and a bomb. The gun jammed up, but they threw the bomb, which exploded near the car. He actually didn't die from the gun or the bomb. He had died from um, an infection in a wound, from a wound that he had uh, from the horse hair that was in his car. So that's kind of ironic. In reprisal, the Nazis killed many innocent people, like in... Uh, in revenge for his death, including they completely leveled the town of Lidis, which killed all of the men, and they sent all of the women and children to concentration camps. So they considered him to be a big deal, and they retaliated pretty harshly when he was killed. Okay, next one. Gert, Kurt Gerstein. Okay, so what did you think about him? I know that most of you probably saw this symbol on his uniform. Um, I'm assuming that most of you made the prediction that he was a perpetrator. Typically, my kids do. All right, he was raised a Lutheran. He was the sixth of seven children. He did initially support the Nazis, and he joined them on May 1st, 1933. However, he believed in God. Nazis did not believe in God. Um, they believed that there was no God, and he began to speak up about his conflict, like his conflict with ideas. Um, he tried to distribute anti-Nazi pamphlets. He was arrested and expelled from the party. He was arrested again in 1938 and tried for high treason, but he wasn't convicted. All right, so you've got to imagine that 
um, this is not going so well for his uh, public life. So eventually, through some family contacts, he was able to get back into the Nazi party. Um, in 1941, his sister-in-law was killed in the euthanasia program, which I'm going to hopefully uh, let you guys look more into. And I think you did. And I know you did in a common lit. Um, he decided to investigate what had happened and he joined the SS to get information. In the SS, he was assigned to Auschwitz to deliver the Zyklon B gas to the gas chambers. Okay, so the gas, the Zyklon B gas that were sent to the gas chambers is what killed the people um, in the uh, gas chambers in the concentration camps. So he admitted that he lost some of the shipments. So he did try to sabotage some of the shipments, which hopefully did save some people, but he did have to deliver the majority of the shipments. So he did kill some people, or probably a lot of people. He also saw the process in the gas chambers and he watched during the gassing procedures. He read up a report. He tried to get a word out to other governments, like to Sweden. He sent his report out to the Catherine, Catholic and Lutheran churches. He was hoping that someone would stop it. Um, I do feel like Kurt felt like it was bigger than him and he was trying to do something but you get to decide whether or not you felt it was enough or not no one did no one listened to him at the end of the war he was arrested and he was put in jail while he was in jail he hung himself they continued the trial and they did find him guilty of war crimes which meant that his wife didn't get any benefits 10 years later his conviction was overturned so i want you to decide do you feel like his actions were enough to make him a rescuer, or was he still a perpetrator? All right, next one on the list is my favorite. Um, most people say that they thought she was a nurse. Um, some people will say that they thought that her eyes looked wicked. She was the most famous of the female Nazi war criminals. She began her career at the ripe young age of 19 at Ravensbrück concentration camp. She gained a reputation for being um, extremely brutal, extremely, um, whoop, didn't mean to mess up there. Sorry, guys. Hold on. She was terrible. Um, she was cruel. She was transferred to Auschwitz because she was so great at her job. And she was promoted and put in char charge of 30,000 women prisoners. She was directly responsible for beating, torturing, and murdering countless victims. She kept a pair of half-starved dogs that she allowed to attack the prisoners. She was later transferred to Bergen-Belsen, which is another division of Auschwitz, where she continued her cruel rampage. There, um, the way that she acted and treated people was even worse because at the end of the war, it was found that she had the skin of three victims made into lampshades, which she used in her apartment. She had human skin stretched across wire into lampshades in her apartment. She was arrested, put on trial, and was the first female Nazi war criminal hung on December 13th, 1945 for her war crimes. Were you correct or incorrect? Are you surprised at the result? All right. Oh, Leopold is next. Leopold Socha. All right. Um, so I want to know what you thought. And here's the truth. He was a former criminal. He worked in the sewers in Lou, what it's called, it's pronounced Wuj, um, in the Ukraine. And while he was working in the sewers, he came across 21 Jews hiding after the ghetto had been liquidated in Wuj um, in 1943. He had two fellow workers with him. They agreed to help the Jews, but only if the Jews paid them. So the Jews paid them for a while, but then their money ran out. When that happened, Leopold decided to help them out by giving them money, and then he would let them pay him the money so that it looked like they were still paying, um, and so that they would not get turned in. He not only brought them food and kept them alive and safe, he also took their clothes home each week, and his wife washed their clothes for him. For 14 months, he protected them, and he was the one to lead them out into the light of the day in 1945 when the war was over. Unfortunately, he died seven months later in a car accident. So he was never, um, like, recognized while he was alive for the things that he did that were good. Although, I'm pretty sure that he was recognized um, post-mortem as righteous among nations. You'll learn more about that later. Okay, Tuvia Belsky. Um, so 
think again. Do you think that he was a perpetrator or a victim or a rescuer? He was actually the leader of a Jewish partisan group in Belarus. He was one of 12 children. He had many brothers, and they all joined him in the woods. At the beginning of sorry, of the war, I think, yeah, he re was recruited into the Polish army, and he, and he married an older woman. In 1943, he organized a group in the forest after his hometown was attacked, and many of his friends and family were killed. He was trying to save as many Jews as possible, and instead of fighting back, they hid, but they did have a defense force. He ended up saving 1,200 Jews, and while they were hiding in the woods, they set up a school, a hospital, and a nursery deep in the forests. After the war, he was offered a position in the new Israeli Defense Forces, but he turned it down. And instead, he moved to New York with his brother in a trucking business for 30 years. He died in the United States in 1985. You have to remember that after the war, there was no place really that liked Jews still. So even though he was um, offered a position there, it would have been really hard for many people to stay. Um, because of all the bad memories. Another favorite, Dr. Jo uh, oh, sorry, yeah, so Dr. Joseph Mingala. Um, so I want to know, I'm going to ask you this one, what you thought he was and why, you know, what, um, what gave you the idea that he was good or bad um, or evil? Did you have suspicions? Did you not? I want you to tell me about that. So he was the famous, most famous SS doctor, um, and he was famous for the inhumane treatment of prisoners at Auschwitz. He was in charge of selection. So he decided when you arrived, if you go left or you go right, um, you can see him with the little green arrow. That's him watching the people. He was in charge of who lived and who died. Um, and he had a special fascination with twins. Um, he loved to do experiments. Um, and many, many things have been uh, produced and written about him. So he began his tenure or his job at Auschwitz in charge of the gypsy camp. And he studied the gypsies and um, like came up with all these ways that they were a race of people. And um, he there's lots of if you've ever been to the Holocaust Museum, there's like a whole section on the Roma gypsies. And there are these. Um, they kind of look like mug shots of the people and they're measuring their noses and measuring their faces and measuring their ears and all these things. Um, because he said that they had distinct, the Jews and the gypsies, they said that they had distinct features and um, that they were a race that needed to be exterminated. He, he felt that way just like obviously Hitler did. Um, so he experimented on twins because one of the goals of um, the Nazi ideology was to become the most superior race. Well, he wanted to figure out how to get good, healthy German women to produce twins to increase the the pure population. So he was fascinated with what happened with twins and how to make women have twins. And so he would do all these terrible experiments on them, like, you know, inject one of the twins with something and see what would happen to the other kind of thing. Um, he was very cruel and he had a, hands, a reputation for being handsome and fatherly, even to his victims before he experimented on. Them. He collected eyes. He was obsessed with irises of two different colors, I'm not going to, uh, heterochromia. He also performed a, sorry, a duty at the unloading camp in Birkenau. That, I've already told you that. He's selecting the weak from the healthy. Many survivor accounts mention him because that he stands out to them. Um, He's part of their memories of the selection process when they first arrive at the concentration camp. At the end of the war, this is not, I don't like this part, but at the end of the war, he fled Auschwitz and was captured by the Americans. They let him go, not knowing who he was. He spent four years working on a farm outside of Bavaria under an assumed name. After that, he escaped, escaped to South America, where he lived until 1979, when he died of a stroke while swimming. In 1985, the, I don't know what that says, but the police exhumed his grave and positively identified his body. So he basically got off for doing all the things that he did and got to lead a long, healthy life. Okay, so one more thing I want to do is I want to talk about the Pyramid of Hate. Okay, so oh, this is going to be hard to see. 
you know what? I'll talk about that next time.